I got two charges here. Let's call it charge Q1 and, ooh, and, uh, and charge two, uh, Q2. And I'd like to figure out what force they exert on one another. And uh, there's a, a rule that tells us, actually a measurement-based rule originally, that tells us what the interaction between these two is. And we can write down that the magnitude of the force between those two charges is equal to, in um, Gaussian units, in, in CGS units, the magnitude of charge 1 measured, remember, in electrostatic units times the magnitude of charge 2 in electrostatic units. Uh, um, and then we take the difference in position between the two, the distance, actually the distance between the two. But I'm going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit careful here about that. I'm going to say that I've got some origin here. And I measure that position with respect to the origin. Let's call that vector R. I'm measuring it with respect to some point. I've just chosen it. And I call this vector R2, R1. No, I won't. Let's see. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, I got charge Q, distance R from the origin, and charge Q prime, I, uh, actually distance and direction vector R prime uh, from the origin. All right? Then, what's going to go in here to get the magnitude of this is R minus R prime squared. I haven't got the direction straight yet. Right? So I need the direction that points between these two. And the rule will be that if I want to calculate the force on this particle, the force on charge Q, due to Q prime, I can never keep straight which one of those two comes first in the subscript. So I'm going to write it this way. The force on Q due to Q prime, okay, is, now I need the direction. What I'm going to do is take the direction vector between these two and the direction vector between these two from the, the, the charge that's going to exert the force to the charge that we're measuring the force on. So I've got a vector which goes like so. And that vector then is R minus R prime. Yes? It's on the notes. It's on the PowerPoints. And what I'm writing here might be wrong. <laughs> so I'm, I can guarantee you, actually, that I'm going to end up accidentally dropping an extra 4 pi in or out of the equation. And I'm going to uh, probably drop an epsilon naught here and there. Okay. Uh, I'm not done uh, here yet, though. That's my magnitude. I need my direction. So I'm going to define the vector here. It goes from r prime to r. Actually, it's just, uh, sorry, q prime to q. All right. And that's how I'm going to define the direction of the forces that are acting here. And I just want a unit vector, so the unit vector is going to be r minus r prime divided by the magnitude of r minus r prime. Okay? Now I'm going to need this magnitude in here, so, uh, so we actually want to write that out. Now let me make sure that I've actually got the sign right uh, uh, here, because I can only do it by checking. If these two charges are both positive, then the forces will be repulsive. So that means the force is going to point in that direction. If they're both positive, then Q1 times Q2 is positive here. Right? And then the force that acts on Q is going to point in the direction from R prime to R, uh, from Q prime to Q. 
Okay, it points in the same direction. So that's my unit vector in the proper direction, right? I want this magnitude here, right? And in order to do that, what I actually do is take the, to, to do this, let's say, if I were a machine and uh, I mean, I could just look at it, inspect it, and figure out what the direction is, or change my coordinate system in order to actually measure the distances and the directions. But I'm, I'm just going to do this in a completely formal way. Well, not completely, but nearly formal way, so that uh, you, you don't really have to think about it. Oops. That's minus r prime dotted into r minus r prime, okay, and then I take the square root and I take the uh, positive root because I just want the distance here, okay? What would that actually be? This vector from that, so if I call this point here 0, 0, 0, right? Then that point up there would be x, y, z for that point. And over here would be x prime, y prime, z prime for that point. So my dot product here actually is then writing it in Cartesian coordinates, the square root of x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared plus All right? That's what my magnitude is. And so when I come back here, I can see that I'm going to cube that, and that would actually be Q1, writing it all out, Q2 over. Q and Q prime. Oops. Um, x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared plus z minus z prime squared to the three halves. And over here, Oops, I might as well write it all out as long as I'm doing it. X minus X prime I plus Y minus Y prime J plus Z minus Z prime K in my Cartesian directions. So that's the force the charge Q prime exerts on charge Q. In this course, we're going to be worried almost entirely about fields, because it's the field that exerts the force on a charged particle. So I could write that the force that Q prime exerts on charge Q is equal to the magnitude of charge Q times the electric field at position R. So I'll just put it here at position R due to charge Q prime. What I've just written here is a completely informal way of writing this. I just wanted to put these things in here to remind you that it's at that point due to that charge, right? So the, the field is the field that comes from the prime to charge, not the charge itself. In calculating the effect of a field upon a particular charge, let's say Q, you always ignore Q itself in calculating the, the, the field. All right? Now I'm going to come back to the field from a point charge, I think, in a couple of minutes. Let's see whether there's anything else that I want to write here. Yeah, there it is. Uh, So I, can, I could write down here, what is the field 
at point R due to charge Q prime. And I won't write out the whole thing. I'll just come back over here and say the field at point R due to charge Q prime, if I look at this thing, has to be uh, Q prime times R minus R prime. R minus I, R prime cubed. So this actually is an inverse square law. And the only reason that the cubed appears here is because my unit vector <coughs> here has got the actual vector and then the length of the vector. So that's what actually brings in the cubed down on the bottom. Okay? So that's the field due to charge Q prime. If uh, and then I need to say, although it's defined there, uh, uh, to be a little bit ex more explicit here, if Q prime is positive, then the field leaves. So positive field points out. That's a unit vector. Negative field points in towards the charge. Now one of the most important things that we can do in order to actually calculate fields and calculate forces is to recognize that if I have um, more than one charge here acting on this charge, so let's say I put Q double prime here and another charge Q <coughs> prime there, all right? Each one of these charges exerts a force on that charge. The forces just add vectorially, and so the fields from each of the charges just add vectorially. So the electric field at some point R due to all these other charges, so I'll just say the electric field at point R due to all the other charges, is the sum over all of the other charges uh, I charges Q sub I R minus R sub I R minus R sub I cubed. Just trying to remember whether I dropped anything out there. Yep. I'm good. All right. So we just add the we just add the vectors. Uh, we just add the vectors up in order to get the total field. Okay. That means that all of the rules that we could deduce from uh, uh, that are related to a single charge are going to apply to collections of charges as well. All of the uh, uh, vector calculus relationships, divergence, curl, and all of that is going to apply equally well. If we, if we can show that it works for one charge, then it's actually going to work for a collection of charges as well, because it's a simple superposition, linear superposition of the, uh, of the vector fields. And so, the electric field, due to a collection of charges, distributed throughout space. Uh, not just a collection, sorry, con a continuous distribution of charges distributed throughout space. It's going to be the, uh, the integral in three dimensions okay, over all the charge that's distributed throughout space. So I'm going to write here dq prime for the moment, but I'll be a little bit more careful about that in a moment. So that's all of the charge except for the charge at the point that I'm concerned with, right? Because I'm calculating field. And uh, in here, I'll put R minus R prime over R minus R prime cubed. So that, what that means is that if I want to calculate the electric field at this point here, at position with respect to the origin, R. Okay. 
and I've got a distribution of charge over here. I'm going to integrate over all of the charge over here, whose position will be given by R prime. I'm going to sum over all of it, but if they're infinitesimal, I can integrate over all of that charge. And what is that really? If I take this thing, this region over here, and I chop it up into very tiny uh, uh, elements of volume, then I've got charge dq prime in there. But dq prime is equal to the charge density in that region space of space, call it rho prime, and g r prime. Okay, in Cartesian coordinates, dr prime is equal to dx prime, dy prime, dz prime. And primed coordinates are different. They are different variables than just unprimed coordinates. I never integrate over r in this case. I'm integrating over the position r prime of the charge, where the charge is. That distinction between the prime and the, and the unprimed coordinates is one that causes problems for a lot of students in this class and also in uh, honors physics, too. Um, OK, yeah, so that's the integral rho. At the prime, I just want to make sure you know that's the prime coordinate. Prime, prime, all right. Uh, R minus R prime. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering where you're using uh, dr for ds, dy, dz. Uh, why not dv? I could. I wrote it like a vector so that it's supposed to be like 3D. OK, so let's do a problem now. I want you to, and this is a problem actually that I gave as a uh, worksheet problem in Honors Physics 2 when I taught it. So some of you are actually going to recognize this. And the problem is this. Let's see, we don't need. Right now, we've completely done away with Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law was the, uh, was the measurement, a set of measurements that told us that the field that we seek looks like this. All right? Now that we've got that, we don't worry about actually calculating the force anymore. We just worry about calculating the field. And then once we know the field, we can calculate the force on any charge that's put in that field. Okay, so Coulomb's law is done. Long live this thing that comes from uh, uh, Coulomb's law. So here's the problem I want you to solve. I have a, uh, a length of rod. I think I said L. the total length of the rod is L. Okay, uh, let's say that the charge per unit length on the rod is Q. That's the total charge on the rod. That's the length of the rod. Okay. We're going to make this one easy this time around and go out here to a distance of R from the center of that line. So I'll take my coordinate. I'll take one of my coordinate systems. And I should measure each of these coordinate systems from the same point. We're going to make this easy for myself when I, I do the r minus r prime stuff. Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll make my uh, the center of my x coordinate system and my x prime coordinate system both here. Okay. At the center of the rod. Distance r out, and we want to find the electric field here. Let's actually <coughs> make that charge positive. Okay, so you're going to use this. 
to uh, calculate the electric field. Yes, and 